Hi there, welcome to our webinar. We're going to start in probably just another minute or two since I know that a number of people are trying to sign on right now. We do have a number of people that are set up. We'll just wait another minute or two and then we'll, we'll, we'll start the session. Thank you for participating with us. All right, we are going to start. Uh, thank you for for attending. Uh, welcome to an hour with the University of Chicago. Uh, we have a great opportunity today. Uh, you're going to be able to listen to and ask questions of Evan Cudworth, who's the New York Regional Director of Admissions for the University of Chicago. Uh, let me just do a little bit of uh, some introductions here. I am Michael Bender, President and Founder of Your College Navigator, and I'm here together with uh, Sherwin Fullington, uh, we're not ready for that. Well, <laughs> Sherwin Fullington, the Director of Test Prep and Admissions for a -list Services, this will be the first in a series of webinars that we will be uh, presenting and bringing to our clients. Just some housekeeping, uh, everyone's PC has been muted. Uh, if you have uh, if you have a microphone in it, we've muted it, and your webcam has been turned off. So please do not change these settings. We don't want to hear the cost in the sneezes. Uh, if you have a question on the lower right hand side, there's a chat box where you can enter any questions that you may have and where we will be allowed time uh, to really answer these questions. See, the agenda today is, I guess there's three pieces to it, or four pieces to it. One is I'm going to give you a two to three minute overview of your college navigator. I'm then going to turn it over to Sherwin, who is going to give you an overview of A list. And then we are going to turn over uh, the uh, the microphone to Evan Cudworth, where for the majority of the time we're just going to talk about the uh, University of Chicago. And then we're going to open it up for questions, uh, questions and answers. So the entire session should be approximately an hour. Okay, uh, let's get started. So we can go back now to uh, that slide, first slide here. Just want to tell you, your college navigator, who we are. Uh, we are Long Island's prime premier college admission advisor. And the way I, when I started the company five years ago, I saw there was increased uh, competitiveness and uh, a real challenge for students really to understand when you have so many colleges now, they're accepting uh, less than, fewer than 20% of their students and many now fewer than 10% of the students. And it's a real challenge. And I saw a real opportunity here. So I initially went out and met with 35 colleges to really understand how to make that decision. And so now it's 125 colleges. So I developed uh, what I refer to as the precise set of principal strategies and, and tactics. And it's now been followed by about 250 students in the past five years, most of which have been really getting into their, into their top choice colleges. In addition, uh, and now we have a very close relationship now for the last three to four years with AMOS. And just some recent uh, recognition, I've been invited to speak at 70 libraries, uh, PTA high schools. I have, I'm an ongoing contributor to Verizon Fios News, Money and Main Street, which is on, uh, you have to get Fios, uh, it's on uh, Wednesdays and Thursday morning. And I'm regularly interviewed by many publications uh, regarding the college admissions process. Newsday, uh, there's 19 other publications. And then I was interviewed uh, five, six weeks ago by Fios News. Um, and that hasn't actually appeared on the news mm -hmm. yet, but I was interviewed uh, for a couple of hours. So that should be appearing shortly. Okay. 
And that's a little bit about the background, but now let's talk about how we work with students uh, to get into a competitive college, college like the University of Chicago, or I'm defining where as any colleges where it's, it's, they accept fewer than 20%. You really need a game plan. It isn't just applying to a college and let's hope for the best and hope I get in. I want every student that I work with to have a plan. So, What's part of the plan? What are the things? Well, first, you really need to clearly understand, each student really needs to understand what makes them interesting, what sets them apart. And when I interviewed many of those colleges, that many, uh, going back over, over the past several years, many of the admissions personnel really let me know that many students don't know what sets them apart. So it's important that you know what sets you apart, what makes you different and continue to enhance. I don't care what grade you're in. There are many of you are now finishing up 11th grade. You still have time to enhance your strengths. You still have another month to, to really work your grades, your test scores, make an impact in any of your activities and you still have the summer. There's still many opportunities to enhance your strengths. Okay. And the second, area that we really work on is to re for students to really research and identify those colleges in which they will thrive. When I talk to the colleges, many of them let me know that students really don't understand what it is about our college and will, how a student will fit and how they will contribute. So I have here 40 plus criteria. I actually have about 50 criteria that I work with students on helping them to understand and differentiate themselves and you have a piece of puzzle there. What I'm trying to do is get you to show how you fit into a college, but also how the college fits you. And if you can do that, you really have, but that is the reason why, or those are the reasons why the college can or should accept you. And if possible, if you are visiting, make it a visit of substance. Just don't do the information session and tour. Meet with professors, attend classes, meet with admissions personnel, meet with students. There's so many things for you to do. Okay. And when you're ready, you weave together a compelling story. And it is the depth of your accomplishments, your experiences, and your aspirations that you really need to focus on. Not just the quality, not the quantity. You also need to focus and we work on superb recommendations. Everyone's going to get good recommendations, but you, to get into these colleges, you need superb recommendations. And you need to help guide your recommenders. What I'm looking for you to do also is become a name, not a number to these schools. I want them to know you personally. You obviously need a powerful and well-focused essay, but also one of the most important, know and communicate why that college should accept you. I ask every student who is applying to a very highly competitive college why they, the college should accept them. And they really, many of them don't have an answer. And what I like to do is get them to focus on the answer to that question. So the next is have a plan. And that's what we do. We work with students on a plan to get into these colleges. Now let me turn it over to Sherwin. Hey. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, nice to be here with you all, uh, just talking about uh, college admissions process, talking about SATs, um, and everything that you guys need to know about um, getting your kids uh, to the next stage of their lives. So A-List and who we are, uh, a lot of you will know about us, um, but we are, I think, one of the premier companies on Long Island um, teaching kids how to succeed at the SAT and the ACT. Um, Alice was started about eight years ago by um, a good friend of mine, Scott Barber, who is our president and CEO now. And he really built Alice off of the um, the hope that, uh, you know, getting people together who are really interested in working with kids and pushing education and um, helping kids understand their potential and reach, reach their potential um, would be uh, really the best way to bring innovation and equity to um, the education sphere. Uh, so over these last eight years, we've worked with thousands kids. Uh, we work with schools, school districts, nonprofit institutions, and of course our private clients um, helping uh, their children succeed in these exams. Uh, what we do is we provide solutions that are tailored to meet, um, you know, any learning uh, specialty that kids have or to meet all the needs that kids have uh, over the course of their junior, sophomore year, and senior year. Uh, so we really tailor our program to make sure the kids get the most out of it. 
Our ultimate goal is to always improve college readiness and access for students. Uh, we're not just teaching kids how to take a test, but we're teaching them how to reason, how to think, and to take skills with them that they're going to be able to use um, and succeed uh, using uh, when in college. Um, our staff comprises of experienced educators, um, and our management staff has over 75 plus years of experience educating and working with test prep. Um, uh, results uh, are, are kids, uh, you know, typically every single year uh, improved by on average about 300 points in the ACT on the SAT and about four points in the ACT. And our students are regularly accepted to the most competitive and prestigious colleges and universities uh, in the country. Um, overall, we provide a large suite of products. In addition to the one-on-one -on -one services that we have in, in families' homes, we also provide um, our SAT and ACT Book of Knowledge, which is a, a product that we uh, put together studying over 15 years of SATs and ACTs. Uh, we have vocab videos, which is an innovative uh, vocabulary tool that combines an engaging content with online resources and videos. Uh, we have College Essay Organizer, uh, which is also a very innovative online tool which helps kids quickly search for and minimize the number of essays they need to write for their college application. Um, and I think overall this leads to us being uh, the best uh, test prep company on Long Island. Um, the last thing that we offer, which I think is truly uh, innovative and different, is that we have the best testing policy um, out of uh, you know the companies that are out there. Uh, we have over access to over 10 years of real tests from the college board and from ACT that our students have access to. Uh, we run tests every single Saturday and Sunday, and we have tailored score reports that really help kids hone in on their areas of strength and weakness. Um, and that's a, a very brief look at A-List and what we do. And we wanted to really turn uh, this over to the star, turn this over to the star of the show, which is uh, uh, Mr. Cutler from um, University of Chicago. Hello, well, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, yeah, my name is Evan Cutworth. I am the New York Director of Admissions for the University of Chicago. Um, I actually graduated from the University of Chicago in 2009 and been with the admissions office ever since. Um, actually, what it means to be regional is I actually live and work here in New York City. Um, actually, this year, about 13% of our incoming class will actually come from New York, um, which is a pretty um, big portion. Actually, about 13% come from Illinois as well. So New York is a big market for us. Um, we're really happy to be here. Um, but I'd like to start that off, too, because I think a lot of people here at the University of Chicago, um, and they think of it as, you know, it's, it's far away or it's not really out there, but um, it's a very, uh, it's a big place where we represent about a third from the East Coast, third from the Midwest, third from the West Coast, and then about 12% of our students are international as well. Um, and what I want to cover, um, so we'll go over the next 30, 40 minutes here, um, I'm going to start off sort of giving you an overview of uh, sort of what the landscape looks like in terms of colleges out there right now, uh, what they're looking for. Um, and, and that'll spend you know, a good portion of time talking about sort of the things about University of Chicago, what it looks like to be a student there, uh, you know, curriculars, majors that you can experience at University of Chicago. Um, but I'm going to spend the majority of time taking sort of step by step through highly selective schools, uh, sort of all of those uh, that we heard about from our cohort, other places what they're looking for when we actually read an application. I read about 1,500 applications this year to go through and spend my nights and weekends and everything pouring over all of your accomplishments. And at the end of the day, we have to build a class of students that's going to come in uh, to University of Chicago um, and sort of talk about what, what that looks like. Um, and then hopefully there'll still be some time for questions. Uh, we'll touch base on those. All right, so um, first and foremost, so, uh, here you can see a little picture of our, our Gothic Quad at the University of Chicago. Um, you see, I was a, um, it's actually a, probably a lot smaller place than you might think. It's actually about 5,000 undergraduates. Uh, we have a 6 to 1 student to faculty ratio. Uh, we're in the top 10 nationally for smallest class sizes um, because discussion is a really big part of what we're about. Um, I think discussion should be a big part of almost any college that you're in. Because nowadays, uh, as, as you can see, as we're doing this in the webinar right now, you can see anywhere, so much of education and knowledge has moved out by, right? Um, we have access to Wikipedia, and even services like Coursera and HarvardX and all these other um, things that are taking a lot of what happens in the classroom and putting it online for free, and we can use it anywhere. So I often ask a lot of students right now, why are you applying to college, right? Um, is it because specific knowledge that you're seeking to obtain, um, because truthfully, um, that knowledge is all there, right? It's all out there for you. Uh, 
Um, if you want to open up, it's not like there's a secret pool of knowledge that we have in colleges. And if you get into a certain school, you have access to that special knowledge. Um, it exists everywhere. Um, but the added benefit, or the reason that you're applying to college, why you want to go there, is because the community in which you learn is probably going to be one of the most important things that you get out of college. Um, the people that you learn with, faculty that are going to engage you and sort of push you to that next level, or even just a simple act of leaving home and moving to a place and saying, hey, for the next four years, this is what I'm going to concentrate on. It changes the way you learn, um, and it changes the way that you're going to be engaged with ideas in the areas. And I think because of that, uh, University of Chicago, we actually have a lot in common um, with many other colleges, so great other colleges you can apply to. Again, I live in, I went to University of Chicago and I worked there, but I've spent five years in the mission profession, and we travel oftentimes to many different colleges, and at the end of every panel, or when I hear from my colleagues, I'm like, hey, that sounds like a great school. I can go there, too. Um, so what I do want to just assure, reassure you all, wherever you're at in the process, wherever you're starting, or if you're a junior, sort of on the precipice, or starting to apply in the fall, uh, at the end of this process, it's going to be okay, right? You're going to find a place. You're going to find a college. You're not going to find universal success. You're going to be accepted at some colleges. You're probably not going to be accepted at some. You'll probably be waitlisted at some schools. For some of you, this might be the first time that you're ever experiencing not instant success. I know that can be scary to think about right now, but success is going to be defined so much more by what you bring to college and how you interact in the day-to-day -day in, that, in that sphere than the bumper sticker that your mom gets to put on her car, okay? Um, so as you go through this process and as you start to hear admissions offices and everyone talk about how great our schools are, we, we love our schools. But at the same time, we want you to find a place that's really good home and a good fit for you. Um, and while I think Chicago is a great fit for a lot of students, I think for some students it's not always um, a great fit. And so hopefully at the end of the day, you'll feel a little more comfortable about what we have to offer, and we'll give you some ideas about what you can uh, go and look for next. All right, so um, again, I interested in earlier and started to talk a little bit about maybe discussion style classes. As you can see here, you know, students sitting on our quad wrangles in smaller discussion classes, talking with faculty. Um, and that is important because um, we practice seminar style discussions. We actually cap our, our core classes at 19 students. Right? So you're sitting in a smaller room, engaging with people, uh, talking about these ideas. Um, and, and I think the core, I mentioned core, um, that is something important to talk about. So University of Chicago is a liberal arts college, uh, which means that um, no matter what you majored in or what you're interested in, you just apply generally to the college. Every class is available to every student. So we don't have separate schools for biology or, or arts or humanities. You just apply generally, and every class is available to everyone. If you, the same thing being, even if you know what you want to do from day one, you're still going to complete a core curriculum which is about 18 different courses. This happens over all four years. Um, the core is important because everyone that graduated from New York, Chicago, whether it was five years ago or 50 years ago, we all engage with similar ideas, similar texts, um, speak similar languages. I say that both metaphorically and literally. Um, everyone is required to have another language proficient, almost fluent by the time they graduate. Um, Every college is going to have different ways of how to evaluate that. So we actually accept AP and IB credits. Um, we also take placement tests when you get to campus. So if you already have a language, you're going to have to step up and you'll test harder parts of that core. Same with biology mm -hmm. and, and physics. Um, you'll take placement tests when you get to campus. So you're never repeating everything you've done in high school. At the same time, um, you might be tested at higher levels. So for example, you won't be taking Bio 101, instead you'll be taking classes like biological poisons and toxins, or plagues, past and present. Right? These are sort of like very high level. What a student who would be majoring in that subject would take a class that looks like this, but you're going to be studying physics with poets and poetry with physicists, and doing so in a way where everyone's supported and sort of excited about ideas, and, and all different types of ideas. So maybe you're not so much of a math science person, or maybe you are and you're not that with the social science. That's OK. But you still have to understand and appreciate why those disciplines are important and, and want to be in class with the people that still are, get excited about all those different types of ideas. Uh, and that's really the core of the University of Chicago's mission, is to prepare every student that graduates with this full range of skills. Um, <clears throat> in addition, so the academics are in the classroom, but a lot of this happens outside of the classroom, too. Um, University of Chicago is a liberal arts college in a research university. We actually have more research positions than students can fill them. Some 15 million volumes in our library. 
Um, you'll see it here in the upper left. This is a library that we built. It houses now um, somewhere between five and six billion volumes underneath. So that is actually just the top of the library. We built nine stories down into the earth. There's a giant robotic arm that you go and sort of pick up um, your books for your, your doing your work. But I think that's, that sort of speaks to the way that we like to do research in New Chicago, that primary sources are very important to us. Um, we never want you to just read something that somebody else wrote about something, but instead go straight to the primary source. Said, if this is the first person that talked about this, or if this was the first, um, you, know, you go right back and read Plato. Um, maybe do it um, in Greek. You know, who knows how you'll do it, but uh, you'll do so in a way that it's not what somebody else thinks. You get your own opinion first, and then we compare those with, with other things. Um, <clears throat> research is not limited just to um, sciences, math, although we do run um, Fermi Lab, Argonne National Laboratory, Marine Biology Lab in Boston, the South Pole Telescope. Um, we also um, have study abroad. We have uh, campuses in London, Singapore, Paris, Beijing. We opened one in Delhi this year. Um, so when I say research, I think sometimes a lot of people get the idea that it's purely medical research. Well, we have lots of medical research. Our hospitals right on campus. Uh, we have paleontologists going across the world. We have yeah, but I mentioned that South Pole Telescope. I think we're one of the few universities where you can study abroad on all seven continents. So, yes, you can go and study for three weeks down in Antarctica if you'd really like to. I, that's not my cup of tea, but maybe that's what you're interested in. Definitely a, a possibility there. Um, but uh, it, it's a very popular option for students. Uh, actually, almost about 50% of our students will study abroad. And many more than that actually have abroad experiences where they maybe during the summer they're not necessarily studying. They're taking an internship, studying a specific language, doing that type of work. Um, and again, this all goes into what I opened with is that the environment in which you're learning affects very much how you're going to absorb that, how you're going to move out of it. Uh, so academics obviously are a huge part of what you want to do, but academics can definitely unless you feel supported by the community that you're involved in. Um, Chicago uh, invests very heavily in community. Uh, we have a house system. Um, Different colleges you're going to look at are going to have different varieties of house systems. Sometimes uh, they're large residential halls. Uh, Chicago's uh, sort of a hybrid mix. We're based on the Oxford Cambridge model of sort of smaller uh, houses, communities of about 50 to 90 students that live together. Each one has its own president, social chair. Um, and these are first through fourth years living in the house. Uh, we actually don't call students freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. Uh, because we don't want there to be that much of a hierarchy in how students interact with each other. Uh, you know, no one's going to say, you know, like, shut up, freshman, <laughs> in your class. You know, you're going to step on the board and you're going to immediately feel that everyone there is, is a scholar in the community. Um, we call our professors by their first name. They do the same to us. And that's just sort of a measure of mutual respect um, that we're going to be interested in, in what you're interested in. Uh, but these houses, um, there's about 11 different dormitories on campus. So usually a house will be four to one of these dormitories. But immediately upon stepping on campus, uh, you know, this is your core group of friends. You'll eat dinner with them. They form your intramural team where you'll be able to compete with other houses. One of my fit, so I was in Wicker House, last house on campus, in my opinion. Um, they're all great, don't worry. Um, but all of these um, different houses, uh, we compete against each other what's called midnight soccer. Uh, so Thursday at midnight, we all get together and compete for the inner house cup. Uh, it's just one of the many sort of friendly, competitive uh, things that sort of make living um, in a college environment uh, feel like home. Because uh, many people are coming from far away or have never lived. Well, uh, uh, many of you have probably spent time in New York and know the city very well. Um, some people are coming from Belfast, Minnesota, or you know, from somewhere in South America, where they're just not uh, necessarily associated with you know what's it like to live in the city and do this kind of work. So. Having this community and having those people all together um, really helps uh, make that position feel like that. Uh, so uh, sports and athletics are, are, are obviously a part of New Chicago. Uh, we are a Division III sports school, uh, which means that all of our students are scholar athletes, right? We don't give specific scholarships for athletes. So everyone that we recruit um, is wants to study at a very high level, but still wants to do sports at a high level as well. Uh, we compete in the UAA conference, which is big schools like Emory, Case Western, NYU, et cetera, all other research universities that also want to compete sort of at a high level of sport. Um, about 70% of the campus is involved in sports one way or another, whether it's just murals or club sports. Um, 
you know, every state is available to every student. We have 14 different martial arts groups, so different people in 14 different ways. By the time you graduate, that's what you want to do. Um, but uh, it's, you know, sort of a fun thing to be there. But I think unlike a lot of other colleges where sports um, create the main nexus of social life, um, I think there's many different uh, areas of social life that, that don't allow uh, that a place like in Chicago. Um, and this is everything from arts, um, which are through here, to, you know, my nations and uh, other clubs and, and all those things here. So I do want to briefly talk about the arts, um, because I think a lot of times when I um, grew out here in New York, I, I get the idea that people heard of Chicago, but it's either through maybe through an economic lens or through something else, but Chicago is an amazing uh, art city, uh, so much going on. And actually, at University of Chicago, we're the home base for a lot of things that's going on in Chicago. Um, improv comedy was born on campus in Chicago. The Compass Players, which run on to go in Second City, um, were founded at the University of Chicago. Um, we just built a brand new 13 story um, center for the arts called the Logan Center. There's three black box theaters, two larger theaters, fan space, visual arts, um, all these things as well. But again, unlike a conservatory school, you don't have to apply simply to be an artist. If you want to be involved in any of these extracurriculars, you simply show up and say, hey, I'm, here. I'm ready to play. Uh, we have three symphonies, ten choirs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so again, check out the website if this is something you're interested in. And, and this goes for, again, every college that you're going to look at. Because different colleges will have different policies about it. You know, who can be involved in certain uh, extra things. So if that's important to you, it should be something that's on your radar. Um, so here in Chicago, um, in addition to all these sort of extracurricular and what we have going on, one of the things that we care very deeply about is helping you marry your academic passion with what you want to do after graduation. Um, so actually, before you even matriculate to the college over the summer, you'll see both an academic advisor and a career advisor. And they'll basically meet with you during the first week college and say, hey, what are you interested in? If the answer is I don't know, that's fine. It's totally cool. Uh, but they'll help you sort of figure out um, if you're maybe on the path to law school, or business school, or medical school, or if you want to go into entertainment or any of these things as options. Uh, they want to get you very early on thinking about what's the path to get there. Because the same way that you have to have a plan about applying to college now, if you can start making plans in the first couple years of college, Start thinking about internships, um, visiting alumni, making those networking opportunities. It's going to make um, your four years of college so much more fun because you'll be able to concentrate on all the things that, that, that you like to do um, without freaking out saying, oh my gosh, what am I going to do by the time I get to graduation? So just a couple statistics here. Uh, New York Chicago is a 10-month graduate. 96% of our students are fully employed or attending graduate school. Um, we, 100% uh, of our students that are in our careers and business program are employed the day of graduation. 96% of our pre-law students can do their top choice law school. And all of this takes, you know, meticulous planning, um, but uh, does so in a way that allows you, if, if you want to go to medical school but you love art history, we can make that happen, right? We can, you can study art history and still shadow doctors, find ways to, to marry those two passions together. I often say you describe this great place for people that are diametrically opposed interests. Um, if you want to make two things fit together that don't necessarily fit, uh, Chicago is a great place to do it. Um, but you can do some environment, again, that's, that's liberal arts. Um, if you're working with lots of different disciplines, I think everything is sort of inherently interdisciplinary. Um, for example, one of our um, arts courses um, that's part of the core that I took was the economics of opera. So we went in and, and looked at um, sort of how Economic ties outside of the art world actually affects how art gets made. Right? Originally, opera was almost exclusively for, um, you know, uh, the kings and queens, right? And sort of as the state happened, as, as more people were able to afford the opera, um, opera changed, and suddenly you saw peasants showing up um, in the opera, all the way to contemporary opera, where it's almost exclusively um, subsidized by hedge fund managers and. Um, the financial services, and so what does that do to opera? Does it change what's being written now? Of what do? So sort of an interesting, interesting interdisciplinary lens. I think it's very characteristic of the way that we like to study things at the University of Chicago. Um, and finally, to close, um, you know, it did our name. We're in the city of Chicago, um, which I think is one of the greatest assets. So University of Chicago, as you saw from these earlier pictures, it actually doesn't look like um, a typical urban campus. We're actually about 215 acres. We're located about seven miles south of the city of Chicago. 
the green, the fleecy, there's lots of quadrangles. You see the bottom right there, that's Botany Pond. Uh, one of our really, uh, our whole campus is actually a national botanical garden. Uh, there's trees everywhere. Uh, but if you want to go into the city um, and explore everything that Chicago has to offer, you know, there's uh, buses and trains and bikes and all different ways to get into the city. Uh, um, there, and the city really is our classroom. It's our muse. It's one of the ways that we get involved. Our University of Chicago IDs, we go for free to all the museums in the city of Chicago, uh, discounts and uh, dance and art events, um, to the theater, um, your house concerts, your concerts, um, the, uh, um, the at a NFL game, or to see the Chicago Bulls and the Blackhawks, and all these are probably great discounts um, for, for students. So I think what another big asset of the city of Chicago is it's one of the the world's great cities. There's so much going on. Um, but at the same time, it's a clean, friendly, affordable city. One that I think is a great place as a college student to, um, you know, explore what it's like to live in city environments, um, to, uh, um, to, you know, to get engaged, to explore, to, uh, uh, to find internships, uh, but also do all those other fun things that you get to do in college. Uh, but still feel like you're in a college environment, right? You come home and people are playing frisbee on the quads, and it feels like you still have that college environment. So I think it's a good marriage uh, for those two things together. So again, so here's sort of where we are. We're, we're on the very south side of Chicago. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go to school. Uh, it's a place that cares, that cares very much about its students. Um, and I think we have a pretty distinctive undergraduate population because we have a pretty distinctive admissions process. Um, as many other colleges uh, that we'll talk about this, my job as an admissions officer, and I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so talking about what I look for in admission, um, is not to choose the best students, right? Because if I were to simply choose the best students, I wouldn't even know where to start. Is that simply the best grades and test scores? Uh, and, or maybe it's the best high school? Um, all these things are, are factors that we look at, but um, if I were to simply admit only students who had scored perfect scores on their test scores, uh, perfect scores, our campus would probably not be a very vibrant place, right? We wouldn't have probably many people that could throw a football, or we wouldn't be able to field um, a symphony orchestra, right? So um, I'm going to open with a quick anecdote that I think um, helps explain this process and really what it looks like and, and what my job is like. And you might hear some, uh, a very similar anecdote from other college admissions officers because we all like to do this. Um, the University of Chicago receives roughly around 30,000 applications a year, right? We have to build a class of about uh, 1,400, 1,500 students every fall to come into the college. Um, and I just spent the last 15 minutes talking about all these great things that happen on our campus. So it's our job as the admissions team to be sure that we find the right kinds of people to do all those things. So for example, I was a cellist. When I graduated from the University of Chicago, there were four cellos. We all graduated from the same thing together. What that meant was there was a big hole in the cello section. So the um, symphony orchestra called up the admissions office and said, hey, um, can you be on the lookout for cello this year? What does that mean if you're applying to University of Chicago this year and you have to play the cello? It means it's a great year to apply to University of Chicago. Uh, we're looking for cellos. Uh, what does that mean for maybe students that are a year younger applying the next year? Not so great a year to apply to University of Chicago for a cellist because we just filled four cello spots here before. So um, the, the moral of this story is, um, yes, this is a personal process. But when you get to the end of the line, and when you get into some colleges and not others, we might not have a very great answer for you. Um, because I can't tell you if we admitted you if you played the cello or not. Because if I were to tell you right now that we were looking next year for cellos, all of you would go out and start trying to take cello lessons. Because that's what you think you need to do to get into college. And that would make you a miserable student, right? And we don't like to be miserable students. So the reason there's a little mystery in this process is because um, we want you, again, you should, yes, you should be working hard at school, you should be doing things that you're passionate about, um, but, but that's what's important there, is you should follow what you generally are passionate about. If you're doing something purely to get into college, or purely because you think that's the only reason that you can do it, um, you're probably aiming for a college that, that's not going to accept you for the right reasons. It might be looking at, at you for sort of a different way. Um, so, uh, 
that's sort of our uh, own admissions office. If, when I read those 1,500 applications every day, I have to break down and say, okay, why do I like this student over this? Um, and oftentimes, uh, this comes as a surprise to students, but uh, you know, those 1,500 students that we that we aim to fill a class, I could wipe them off the face of the map and take the next 1,500 students in line, and nobody would know the difference, right? They would look almost the same in grades and test scores and a lot of other things, but it would just be a slightly different characteristic breakout of what they look like. So your goal should be build, to build a smart college list um, to, to apply only to colleges that you think you'd be a good fit at, fit at and definitely enjoy, uh, but also to do your research. And it's very, very important uh, to have that um, answer to that question why I like why. So I'm going to go and break through some sort of what I see as sort of the five criteria that we look at and give you a little bit of an idea of how you might put your best foot forward into what those five look like. Um, so just to give you an idea, and then we'll go through that. The first and foremost is your transcript for your grade. Second one is, is test scores. Third is your extracurricular, so you do outside of school. Fourth is your essays, sort of how you write and what you look for. The fifth is sort of an amorphous, all those other things together. This could make up your interview, um, your college, your recommendation letters, which you can go get for your teachers, and, and a little bit of uh, what's known as family privilege interest. Um, this can be, um, are you actually very interested in college? So to give you the quick breakdown, I opened with transcripts. And notice I did not say GPA. Um, this is important because certain colleges are, are going to look at your GPA, and that's what they're going to ask for. At highly selected schools, most of us don't look at GPA and actually don't have an average GPA breakdown uh, because there's no such thing as having GPA anymore. Um, high schools have gotten very creative at using 4.0, 5.0 scales, 6.0 scales, 100 point scales, weighted, unweighted, and there's some schools in Brooklyn that's where we made on name that actually use smiley faces. That's <laughs> great. So when I get asked what's the average GPA, I say, I don't know, 4.5 smiley faces out of a frowny? I don't know. Um, so the idea here is what we have to do with admissions officers is I go in and I go point by point, I look at every class you took in high school and say, did you take rigorous courses? Did you do well in those courses? Um, and I confident that you're going to be academically prepared to do the work at my college. Um, again, this is going to differ from, from school to school, but you should know that um, when we're looking to compare you, um, I'm not going to, we have to compare apples to apples. So I'm never going to say, oh, this student um, has an APIB program, therefore they're an advantage compared to a student that doesn't have this type of a program. I, I visit high schools, I get to know the high school, I get to know everybody who's involved in that area, and hopefully by um, the end of uh, that process, and I read these these profiles. I have a good idea of, of what uh, that, that transcript what that student looks like. So that's that's something important to, to keep in mind there. Um, the second is your test scores, um, and test scores are important, uh, and this is something that, that you should get to know. Um, you're going to visit these college admission sessions, and they'll say that we need um, uh, uh, holistically. We need that we're going to look at sort of lots of different. Um, types of things in the application, and these are all here, but you should take it on your own to go and look at the average test score of what um, colleges are looking for. Um, University of Chicago, well, testing is definitely not the number one thing we look at. Um, testing is fairly um, important um, for certain types uh, of students that we're looking at. Um, so preparing well for this and taking it seriously uh, is, is important for us as well. Um, the, the third thing here is extra quick though, I talked a little bit about this earlier, um, but uh, you should be sure that, um, again, you're doing things that, that you're passionate about, um, and, and that, as, as Michael opened it up with, that uh, qual uh, quality over quantity, right? You shouldn't just be looking to fill up with, with everything that, that's really, uh, that, that you're doing it just to, to look at for college. Um, I often get asked, you know, do I need to be doing volunteer work? Uh, do I need to be taking classes outside of college? Um, the, the great answer is there's not one specific um, thing that, that you need to do, um, but we just want to know how you spend your time and, and are you using it in a way that you feel is productive. And there's a way that we're going to be, um, that, that you think that we want to have on our campus, right? Um, so if you like to play video games, great, that's okay. I'd love to play Halo in college. Actually, the creator of Halo actually went to Chicago and formed the company right out of college. Um, but 
you should want to connect that with, with something else. Um, uh, you know, we just don't want to see that your particular sheet is every day I go home and play on Xbox Live for eight hours, right? Uh, because uh, there needs to be something else that, that you're going to bring to our college campus um, that, that's going to make us excited to want to have you there. And it's going to make you a great roommate uh, on top of that there. Um, and just again, to close out this extracurricular side, uh, don't. Uh, uh, I think again, sometimes the pressure is, you know, you know, wanting to to get your parents to, you know, pay for expensive trips abroad, or you need to, you know, go volunteer um, somewhere else. Being aware of your context and uh, where you live, and and how you um, can contribute to the community you're in is important. Um, but you never should need feel the need to prove that through. Um, uh, you know, doing something just to prove that you can do it. Um, so if you care about the communities that you're in, and you're, you're able to show that through your application, that's great. Uh, but please don't, um, you know, uh, make that your number one goal. It, but that's not the secret to take it to college. There's not some secret opportunity or anything, one thing in particular that's going to sort of get you to the next level. It has to be a whole package uh, that you sort of build together again through this plan. Uh, and then finally, to touch on sort of these uh, uh, amorphous things that I think um, uh, are on the plate sometimes in the process. Um, for one, the interview. Um, sometimes interviews, uh, most of the time interviews are optional for colleges. We actually um, do interviews both on campus, uh, but also many of our alumni host interviews throughout um, the area here. And most colleges will have optional interviews you can sign up for. If you're interested in the college, I highly recommend you doing an interview. Um, pretty much the only two requirements are being able to make eye contact and um, ask a couple interesting questions, right? These are not, um, you know, you're not going to get grilled on, you know, word problems and things like that. They just want to talk to you about what your favorite classes are, uh, what, you, what you like to read, sort of books that are interesting to you. Um, interviews, I think, a lot lower pressure than, than you've heard about what they actually are. So don't, don't be too worried about that. And then finally, these recommendation levels. Um, if you haven't already um, started being nice to teachers, now is a good time to start. Um, but basically, this is our idea that, um, you know, can you have a relationship with an adult, with one of your teachers, a professional or an tutor, where they respect you and, and want you to go on to continue to learn in an environment? Uh, because sometimes, you know, you might be getting great grades, but maybe you're the type of student that shows up and, um, is maybe a little quieter in class. Um, but if that's your style of learning, that's okay, but just be sure that you're talking with teachers and say, hey, you know, this is the way that I like to learn. And, and can you talk about that in my recommendation letter? It's okay to, to have that conversation. Right? You don't need to go in blind. Um, uh, be sure that you can ask for a positive recommendation letter, right? There's nothing more jarring than these admissions officers opening a file and, you know, sometimes these letters are not entirely positive um, from teachers. Uh, that's something to be scared of, but you just need to, to know and, and be able to have that conversation to say, hey, I, I, I'm looking for a positive recommendation for you. Is that something you can or to me? Um, so at the end of the day, when we take all these different factors together, um, I, as the local admissions officer, will read this. I'll make up notes, and then I'll send this on to another admissions officer who will read, and they might agree with my opinion, they might disagree. Uh, sometimes it will be bounced around between three or four different admissions officers who all um, weigh in, um, and yes, some of this is a subjective process. Um, but because of that, uh, when we go to build a class and we go into the standing committee, um, we're looking and we're saying, hey, I think this student has this specific package, and, and we're going to advocate for that for admission. And when it comes to the end of the day, when we build this class, at the end of it, um, every day on May 1st, um, it's one of the most stressful days for us admissions officers. Because it's the day when all students have to apply to the colleges they've applied to and say, yes, I'm coming or not. So believe it or not, as scared as you all are of not getting into your top college, I'm most terrified that my favorite students aren't going to say yes to me. Um, so yes, we have favorite students. So we, all of our students that we admit are our favorites. And we want them to come. We're really, really excited to be there. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, you're all people on your side of the process. We're all people, too. We're admissions officers. We're not scary people. We all went to college. We all went through this process, too. And we want you to find a great place. Um, unfortunately, um, because of the way the process works, there's many more qualified applicants than to fill them. 
Um, but again, if you build a plan, if you do your research, if you apply to the right types of schools, this process will be a lot less excuse me, a lot less stressful, um, and you're going to find a, a great place for you. Um, so with that, um, I think we're going to open up the questions, and hopefully um, some have come through. So great. No, no, I'll do that again. So let's see what we got for questions. I have some questions. Sure. So let's let's see what we've got. Let's see what we've got well, um, um, while while you're looking, Erwin, um, a couple of questions. You mentioned demonstrated interest. Right. Can, we, can you just expand on that a little bit for the, for the purposes? Great. So there's this concept called demonstrated interest, and basically what it means is, um, so as I, as I close with, uh, colleges are very interested in saying, okay, if we admit students, we, what, are they going to come? Are they interested in, in our campus? And so different colleges will gauge this interest in different ways. Um, some colleges will actually look and see, did you visit campus? Uh, did you do an interview on campus? And that might factor into um, the students they, they ultimately choose to admit or not. For the University of Chicago, that is not a, a, a factor that we explicitly use. Uh, we know that it's not possible for every student to visit campus, and that's okay. Um, however, um, there are ways that you can demonstrate interest that, um, for example, through your ethics, um, doing research and saying, Hey, I'm interested in the University of Chicago because you know they have a really great astronomy and astrophysics program, and they have a, you know, they run the telescope in the South Pole, and, and it's, it's going much more into depth than just saying, hey, I really like city schools, and I'm applying to the University of Chicago because it's in the city. There are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of schools that could fit into that city category, and and if we're seeing that that's the only reason that we're applying to the University of Chicago, it doesn't give me a lot of confidence as an admissions officer that you've done your research or that you're very interested in what you attend. So I think as years grow, as the years have gone on and colleges have gotten more appended, I think demonstrated interest in one way or another has become uh, much more important for certain types of colleges. Mm -hmm. And then just talk, talk a little bit about what do you think, when you say do research, and I covered research in the very <coughs> beginning, what do you mean by doing research? Great. So I think that so some colleges, not all colleges, but many colleges will ask you to write a short essay about why you're applying to specific colleges. It's called the Why University Access, right? Um, I think as high school students, this can seem initially kind of easy. When you actually sit down to write it, you'll say, I'm applying because, you know, maybe they have a specific major you're interested in, or maybe it is because it's in the city. But I'd encourage you, if you can think of seven to ten unique things about each one of I'm coming to short. Um, seven to ten unique things about why you're applying to that specific college, that will really help you gear and demonstrate interest through that essay um, about what that college has to offer. In addition, research isn't just it's about, about you, but I think you need to be prepared um, to know how competitive certain colleges are too, right? Um, there are certain testing bands where students are more or less um, competitive when they, when they fall into Area. So, for example, University of Chicago, I think, so we've never looked at the writing section of the SAT, but out of the uh, other two sections, um, our middle 50%, which means about 50% of people score between these two bands, is about 1450 to 1540, right, which is fairly high um, in, in the higher education landscape. That's not saying that it's required to get in those testings, about 20% of people score below that band, but you should know as you're applying to different types of colleges, what um, what you might look like in the greater pool of successful students that are there. Uh, Peter, uh, Evan, I think you kind of uh, might have answered this in uh, your your discussion earlier, uh, but I do see a question from Peter that came up. Um, can you discuss the opportunities University of Chicago has uh, offers that you brought to in France? I don't know if you know anything about in France itself. Um, and also, do you have any foreign campuses? Of course. So yeah, University of Chicago, very uh, international school. Um, we very much encourage students to study abroad. There's actually a component of the core curriculum that every student must complete that actually you can do this core abroad. It's called civilizations. And many students choose to do this abroad. We actually do have a campus in France. Um, over 500 students study there every year. We have professors that oh, live in the city. Um, we uh, also have uh, campuses in London, Singapore, Paris, 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 Paris,
Delhi. Uh, we also offer uh, many partnerships um, with different types of colleges and campuses. Um, I did a study abroad program in Toledo, Spain, um, which was actually a language program where we signed a contract that said I will not speak English for the next three months. Uh, we lived in the family and took classes in Spanish literature and art. Um, again, foreign language is not required to study abroad. You can do classes in English, but if you have that competency, um, you can study abroad. And actually, specifically in our France um, campus, you can actually do economics in France, um, astro astrobiology, I think they also taught there, and lots of classes both in English and French there. Uh, I also have another question for you, um, Evan. Is there, so, is there, since I'm so involved in the test prep side, um, <laughs> a lot of families and kids that I work with will, will often ask, what's the minimum score to get into X school? Um, is there a minimum score? How do you navigate students that might have lower scores um, when considering them for admission? Great. So there is no minimum test score for a place of English school. Um, and we, I read every application that gets submitted in English class. We don't do any sort of sorting by testing or grades or anything like that. What we are going to do is look at you a little bit in the context of, of both where you went to high school, uh, what your parents do. Um, all of these things are slight factors in how students perform well, perform on standardized tests. That being said, um, what we're looking for first and foremost are students that are going to be successful on our campus. Um, so, for example, um, you know, if you're applying in a math science field, specifically pre-medicine or something in those areas, having strong math test scores is pretty important uh, because what we're going to do is look at you know, the full range of students that are applying. As you're sitting right next to somebody else and if they have higher test scores than you do um, and you look fairly similar side to side, we have more confidence that person with the higher test scores has worked harder, is going to show up on campus. and and be a better student. Um, it's not a perfect system, but it's just one of the many ways that we look at um, test scores in the full context of the application. Okay. Just want to remind everyone, uh, since we do have a few minutes left here, um, please, if you have questions, uh, there's, there's a chat feature at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, please feel free to ask any questions through that. I, I will see them and leave them uh, so that Evan can answer. Okay. Give it another minute. Yeah. I'm trying to dive anything else, words of wisdom. Um, yeah. Uh, I, mean, I think visiting is important. Um, even if you can't visit, you might be looking at colleges across the country or different places, but if you can visit colleges locally, that might look like those other colleges. So I, I encourage you to visit a liberal arts college, a state university. Um, a city university, you know, CUNY and, and CUNY colleges, um, visit what those look like. Uh, just see what those kinds of campuses look like. You know what? And we were talking about before, what do you mean by visiting college? Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I think we can expand on that a little bit. Right. Well, I, yeah, don't just show up and walk around. Uh, but if you get a chance, you know, to visit an information session there um, to, uh, to go on a tour, to meet the students there, sit down in the dining halls and see what, hear what students are talking about. Um, you know, I think uh, you can get the idea that you know, the you're not going to be going to school with the architecture. Right? You're going to be going to school with the students. So the more time you can get a chance to sort of see what the students are like, engage them in conversation. Students, high school, or sorry, college students love to talk about themselves. And so just go up to them and say, hey, what's your experience been like? Or, or is this a good place? Um, and oftentimes they'll be very upfront and honest with you. Um, and that's a good place to start. Can they order the class? Some colleges will allow you to sit on classes. Most will only, uh, most colleges will reserve that for seniors. Right. Um, and sometimes you have to sign up beforehand, some not. But again, check the website and that's an option. Okay. Uh, I have another question for you, Evan. Uh, in terms of uh, where Chicago is located. Um, I went to school in, in, in Boston and Cambridge at, you know, at Harvard, um, and it was great when I got there in, you know, end of August or September. It was beautiful. It was warm. Um, how do kids deal with the cold in Chicago, <laughs> the winters in Chicago? Um, because that's something you probably don't get too many questions about uh, in the spring and in the fall months. I think it's very true. I think it looks somewhat similar to Boston. Yeah. Right? Um, so it's been some, some winters actually both places. Um, so I think one of the big things is, you know, you're going to, to 
college, right? And and everything is new and sort of exciting in lots of different ways. Um, you know, adjusting the weather is like adjusting everywhere else. The University of Chicago has a 99% retention rate for the sophomore year, which means 99% of people attend or uh, return, um, which is actually the second highest in the country. And so we have a lot of people from the South. We have people from Abu Dhabi and all over the place. They come. They adjust very well to the winter as you would anywhere else. I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, you, you know you work hard in class, the reason that you find a scarf and, and you work through it. I love the winters there. Um, we had, um, there's all kinds of winter sports. We have a, a figure skating rink on campus. We play broom ball. Um, you know, there's all kinds of activities. We do disco study breaks every Sunday night to sort of blow off steam. So it's not like you're in isolation. You're with 5,000 other people your age hanging out in the city. It's a lot of fun. There's a couple more questions. Yeah, sure. I have one from Peter that I'll read out loud. Sure. Uh, the question is, from data published in the U.S. News and World Report site, over 60% of the undergraduates um, uh, major in social sciences, math, and science. Can you discuss the general character of the student body in the context of that info? Is the school's character more math, science, social science oriented? And how might a student interested in the arts and humanities feel at the University of Chicago? That's great. So, um, yes, yeah, so I think it, it might be about that. So we actually split the college into sort of two. We say math, science, and then humanities, social sciences. We actually put social sciences and humanities together. Um, we're actually very evenly split. Um, I, it's funny, I recruit out here um, in New York, and I often hear, oh, is Chicago like a very uh, math science school? When I'm on the West Coast, we're almost exclusively known for humanities and arts and all this other side of things. So it's just interesting how sort of even regional biases might, might come to play there. Um, I was an uh, English major at the University of Chicago. I do a lot of theater. We put on over 50 shows a year with the University of Theater. Um, there's so much research in the arts going on. Um, we have many different research institutes um, actually dedicated to both art and performance, um, sort of, and we have a whole program called the Art of Science and Science of Art. So we'll look at everything from how computer modeling has actually affected um, visual arts and, and data um, uh, collection, and sort of how can we turn that into art. Um, so I think you, as an art student, you will be you know, very much at home in a place like you Chicago. Again, don't take my word for it. Um, visit the website, arts.uchicago.edu. There's so much going on. All right, I think we're wrapped up. Uh, Wonderful. Great. Right? Okay. <laughs> last slide. Uh, last slide, yeah. yeah. Um, for follow up, for follow -up uh, to some contact information here, if you have any, any further questions. Okay, four. Uh, I'm just going to make it a little bit. All right, maybe. <laughs> It's good. It's just technology. Mm -hmm. All right, let's leave it that way and we'll work off of that. Okay. So follow up if you have questions to the University of Chicago. Here is the email address for the University of Chicago. Actually, the email address is for all of the companies, the University of Chicago for your college navigator and for Avis. There's also uh, telephone numbers here for your college navigator and Avis. And for anyone who's on this call, uh, what we've discussed, here is uh, doing a one-hour complimentary consultation with anyone to help them develop their, their plan. So hope uh, you got a lot of today's session. And for any further questions, just email us or call us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. What we should do is just make that make it for you. There you are. I want to get a, I want to get a bigger picture of it somehow. Yeah. Can we get that captured somehow? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how to actually make us bigger. You hit that now. Uh, I did, I did it on another yeah. computer. <laughs> Yeah, my computer, I can do that. I don't think I can do more computer. Okay. Well, we should try it on that computer. We should get a big picture of it somewhere that we can, we can turn it to.